All right, I'm going to do a real quick video here, just a, a rebuke um, and a warning. I just really feel the Lord wanting me to, to put some of this stuff out there. Um, everybody has heard of the Roman Catholic uh, perversion things, the pedophilia, uh, that, but there's a lot more that goes on, Just not not just pedophilia. I mean, there's nuns that are raped routinely by priests and things like this. I mean, there's sodomy within the priesthood and things. And there's videos all over the Internet. I mean, you can watch it. Uh, there was one I saw years ago, a documentary done by secular people, and it showed Roman Catholic priests going to a you know gay bar, and they're up there dancing with other perverts and stuff like this. So it's not just priests raping little children. And you know you'll bring this stuff up, and Catholics will go, "Well, it's in the Protestant churches too." Uh, well, yes, it is. Absolutely. See, the problem is not so much Roman Catholicism. I mean that's just a recipe for disaster because you have forced celibacy on priests and they're in confessional booths, you know, auricular confession, forcing sexual uh, dirty secrets out of children. Well, you can blackmail people very easily that way. So Roman Catholicism is, of course, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, but she has daughters. Those are the Protestant systems. And uh, you say, well, I'm an independent Baptist. I'm not a Protestant. Well, uh, if you understand what an independent Baptist used to be, uh, that a Baptist was a derogatory term, just like Christian. They were called Christians first in Antioch, Acts chapter 11, verse 26. Early Christians were called, well, I should say, non-Protestant Christians were at one time called Baptists because Protestants were still baptizing infants. You had Luther baptizing babies. Uh, a lot of the, the other Protestant denominations baptize babies. The Methodists do it and things like that. So they would call Christians that were baptizing adults, they'd call you a Baptist or an Anabaptist, a rebaptizer. Uh, if you don't understand church history, that's what was going on there. But the modern day independent fundamental Baptists are Protestants. They are doing the same things that other Protestant denominations are doing. They bear no resemblance at all to Roger Williams or John Smythe or any of these old time Baptists from back in the 1700s. Uh, the first Baptist church building in America was built in 1700 by state lottery, by the way, too. Uh, you can watch our independent fundamental Baptist Catholicism videos if you want to see more on that to see the proof. But um, the sex perversion in these Babel buildings is so prevalent today because, not because of Protestant versus Catholic, they're, it's there because of the actual temple themselves, the actual concept of where did this church building come from. They're pagan temples. Again, I've talked about that in the study. That they are Parthenons, Greek Parthenons. They would have had sex orgies as part of their worship way back when. The Catholics took that thing and made it Christian. You know, we can worship Jesus Christ in these buildings, which you can't. And they put Egyptian obelisks on the top called a steeple. And now the Baptists come along and they say, well, see, we can take them too. It's absurd. And what I'm telling you is if you're saved, you need to get away from these buildings because I have seen 100% of the time, 100% of the time, these buildings have problems. And it's not, well, all Christians have their issues. and all. No, 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 no. Problems directly related to the building itself. See, you're under a curse in that building. And again, you know, oh, it's the old time religion. 300 years old? That's not what Christians were doing. And, you know, it's, it's like my, my wife and I were talking about this this morning. It's like, so people with church buildings today somehow have evolutionary philosophy because they think to themselves, well, yes, Christians in the first century met in homes, but we don't today, or, you know, we have buildings today, kind of like if, if we could be back in the first century, the first century Christians would come to our buildings because they're far more superior to meeting in homes. Uh, no, they would have avoided them, I guarantee you. Again, is the Christianity of today with your church buildings, is it better than what was going on in the first century? I think not. But I'm going to share with you some personal stories today. And don't you try to psychoanalyze me, you little psych psychiatrist, little whatever's out there. Don't, don't, well, you've had pain in your past. You need to let the pain go. Oh, shut up. Just shut up. I mean, there's no nice way for me to put it, so just shut up, okay? I get that thing in the comments. Well, you just, your pain is what dictates your truth. No, 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 no. This is what dictates my truth, okay? The Bible. 
But I'm going to show you a couple things here. And I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. Okay, experiences that I have seen from church buildings. First of all, one of my childhood friends, I've talked about him in other studies, a guy named Travis Metzler. He was uh, sexually molested as a child at a Methodist summer camp. Okay, it messed him up so bad that he eventually killed himself a number of years ago. All right, and it was, and it was covered up. I remember he was gone from school for a while and everybody was kind of like, what happened to Travis? What happened to Travis? You know, everybody's like, what in the world? And he came back and he was acting very different because they put him on medication, you know. So he was just kind of somewhat like himself, but not all there anymore. And what happened is it went in over time and he stopped his medication cold turkey, not understanding the fact that the medication is, is based on all kinds of toxic chemicals, uh, just poisonous. And it had thoroughly messed his mind up. And, you know, there was other issues there. He was eventually, you know, I, I had his uncle tell me that he was actually getting into sodomy himself. So really, really messed his mind up. And it was done by a church. And it wasn't a Catholic church. It was a Protestant. Uh, another story. Uh, when I was young, again, I heard some kind of a thing going on with the youth group at the cult that I was raised in. Calvary Monument Bible Church, and uh, found out later on that it was actually a sodomite orgy. A bunch of the young men in the uh, youth group were basically performing sodomite acts. And it was found out, but you see, nothing was done because when you have a church building, you have to think of the whole building. And you can't have the whole building be brought down over a few bad things in there. Although Jesus said a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, but let's just disregard that. You say, well, how would a house church have helped that situation? Very simple. Because you can say, hey, we're meeting at such and such place here. We're meeting out in the field. We're meeting out in the forest. We're meeting in so-and-so's living room or out in their barn or whatever else. You don't look at the building as holy. You look at the people. So you deal with the people and not, oh, we don't want to bring down the corporation. And this event, by the way, this sodomite orgy was completely covered up. You know why? Because the fathers of the young men involved were all big name people in the church I was, I was raised in. They covered it up. I'll tell you another story. Uh, the assistant pastor at Calvary Monument Bible Church when I was a young man, his name was Brian Boykin. Brian Boykin uh, stood up at one point I remember it was a Sunday morning and it was like he stands up and he says, I have a confession to make. And his wife is right there beside him and he says, uh, I committed adultery. I had a, an act of, I don't know if he said fornication because they weren't using the King James by that time. They go on to the new versions. But uh, he, committed, he committed fornication, cheated on his wife, and he was repenting. He repented before God. He repented before his wife. And now he was making the announcement and he stepped down as pastor. Good man. Praise the Lord for that. I'm glad that he had the guts to do that. And that was front of, in front of probably, I don't even know, eight or 900 people, maybe, something like that. It was a pretty big church that I went to, I was raised in, you know. And I mean, the conservative suit and tie, the old hymns, the uh, old-timey church, you know, that I was raised in. But you say, well, what's that have to do with anything? You see the spirits that are involved in these church buildings. And I'll tell you right now, and I can say this 100% of the time, Either the pastor gets brought down because he's in a pagan temple dedicated to sexual sin. It's a pervert building. Literally. I'm not, I'm not just being funny or, or trying to be mean-spirited or whatever. These buildings are pervert palaces. Special new word for you there. They're pervert palaces. They have an obelisk on top. A symbol of, it's a phallic symbol. And sorry to be a bit graphic here, but it's made it, it's it's symbolizing the male organ. An uncircumcised male organ is what the the steeple is all about. It it comes from the obelisk. Look up the stuff from architecture. Again, I have it in my study showing the proof. The in, the uh, independent fundamental Baptist Catholicism stuff. It's right there. So what do you think is going to happen to a preacher that's in this pagan temple trying to serve the Lord in that thing. I mean, should I start filming some of my videos in a, in a topless bar and say, I'm sanctifying it? No big deal. 
I'm not dumb enough to think that it's not going to affect me. I'm saved. I'm born again. I have a wife. I love my wife. But I know better than to get around porn pornography or, or topless things or, or whatever. I stay away from that stuff. The Bible says flee fornication. What? Why on earth would you build a, a temple called a church when those temples are derived from pagan buildings where fornication was there? Performed there in the past. But we can Christianize it. Kind of like a Christian rock music. Rock and roll, euphemism for fornication in the backseat of a car. Look it up. That's where it came from. I'll give you another one. Uh, there was a family, I can't think of their name, was Overholzer or something, I forget. But they went to Calvary Monument. The father was a pedophile, a convicted pedophile. He, be, he got caught, got convicted. Again, they covered it up. Let's not talk about that. Why? It goes on all the time, people. Another one, Mount Zion Baptist Church. The pastor there, Keith Schweitzer. Now, this one I can't prove. I don't have, I can't say that definitely it came out or whatever else, but I was going there and I had this weird feeling. It was just kind of like a, it was this really plasticky, oh, hello, it's nice to have you in our church, and blah, 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 blah. And then I saw him with one of the youth, teenage girls that was dressed like a street prostitute, you know, and he's standing there back in the back with her and he's, he has his finger in her hair, twirling her hair. And she's, ah, you know, all this stuff. And he's playing with her hair. Married man with three children. You say, well, was he fornicating with her? I have no idea. But you see, he's playing with fire. Hands off. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 7 begins with, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own youthful teens that he can play with their hair. Oh, no, it doesn't say that. It says, let every man have his own wife. But yet you get into these church buildings and there's women there. And there's young girls that come up, oh, pastor, oh, you know. And you watch Jack Hiles, the sex pervert that he was, and all these young girls singing, we love you, preacher, you know, and all this stuff. What are they doing? They're messing around. Why do you think Jack Scapp fell? Getting ahead of myself. Lamb Peter United Methodist Church, another one that I went to for a little while, down there in Lancaster County. They were wife wife swapping there, switching wives up in the front rows. One week, he's with this woman, and that woman is with that man. The next, it's they swapped. Of course, they were doing it through marriage and divorce and everything, but what's the big deal? Why are these things happening? Is it just a coincidence? And it's happening thousands and millions and millions of times across the world. Why? Because you get professing Christians meeting in pagan pervert palaces. That's why. Another one from Lancaster County. There was a Brethren Church there. And a very, very wealthy businessman at that Brethren Church. And he was raping multiple children. And it was covered up. Over and over and over again, brethren. Why? He just kind of pay out to the parents a little bit and stuff like this. And finally some of those children got older and they spoke out against it. But you see, the very best place for a pervert to mess with children is in church buildings. Because, hey, I'm the preacher. I got a suit and tie on. You can trust me. Oh, it's such an honor. The pastor wants to take our child back to his office and have him help him with such and such. And I'll tell you right now, these preachers that molest these children, I pray God gives them an extra hot section of hell to burn in for all of eternity. And if you know that this stuff is going on in some stinking Babel building that you're going to, and yet you look the other way, God have mercy on your soul. Don't 
tell me that you can be saved and go to some stinking church building someplace and you know that there's sexual sin and yet you just kind of turn the blind eye to it and, well, that's between them and the Lord and stuff like this. I heard, I heard some pervert the one time and he's like, he's like, well, you know, some guy got caught for perversion and, uh, you know, they, they were going to kick him out of the church and we voted no because church is where he needs to be. That's where he needs to, to get his help. Totally, completely unscriptural. You kick them out. I mean, what do you think 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is all about? Kick them out. Get them out of there. But you see, when there's money on the line and you have a big building and it's a corporation and everything else, and well, we can't kick them out. That could make us look bad. We could lose some of that revenue and things like this. And, you know, Brother So-and-so has always really been faithful with his giving and he's just having a little bit of hard time right now, a little, little trouble with raping children. So let's keep him in the building. Give you another one. Dr. Arnold Killinger. Yes, I name names, by the way, too, if you haven't figured that out. Dr. Arnold Killinger, Cornerstone Baptist Church in uh, Lidditz, Pennsylvania. Another one I went to for a while. And I talked to him. I mean, a lot of these guys, I've talked to them. I've sat across the table, talked to them, you know, whatever. Married. Married man, had two children of his own, two adopted children. And things were going a little rough there at the Babel building, so he had to get a job. And at his job, there were two other women there working with him. And he asked them, he, he propositioned them, basically, to have an orgy. Him and the two women together. And this isn't some kind of a real good-looking guy or anything else. Totally ruined his marriage. Last I heard, he's living in some dingy little apartment, you know, by himself. Wrecked his marriage. Why? Why? Because the Babel buildings carry a certain spirit with them. And let me tell you right now, even the very best men, even the finest men out there, are going to have problems. They themselves might not fall. They might fight it and fight it and fight it and fight it and fight it. But their staff will. People within their Babel building will. You cannot serve God with the things of Satan. Church buildings are of Satan. That's where they came from. Uh, just a recent thing up here. Uh, New Sweden, up above us a bit here. Uh, there was a Lutheran cult building. And a member of the cult killed another member. You know? And that stuff goes on too. And again, another story from, from down uh, Lancaster County area. There was a, a gospel men's quartet. And one of the guys, one of the singers, uh, his first wife fell down the steps and died. And his second wife was killed in a car accident. Only they found out that actually, no, she was dead before they were in the car accident. He faked the accident to cover up for the fact that he had murdered her. And then they started doing some investigation, they found out, no, actually the first wife was actually dead before he pushed her down the steps to fake her death. Up there standing in front of the, the, the service. What a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning up. Murdering his wives. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and let me just tell you another little uh, story here too. I talked to a guy from uh, the Bible Baptist Church in Pensacola, Florida. You know, one of my uh, heroes in the faith, uh, Peter Ruckman, went home to be with the Lord now. And uh, Dr. Ruckman had different guys working for him and stuff. And I talked to one of the guys down there. And, uh, and I, I had made a comment about this Mount Zion Baptist Church. It was ridiculous that they had police background checks for the Sunday school teachers. And they said, well, you know, we have to do that now and stuff. This guy from Ruckman's church. And he's like, you know, we've, he's like Brother Donovan, you know, Brian Donovan, who's now the senior pastor there. Uh, you know, he's, we've been having some trouble with some of the students and perversion and stuff like this. Why is there so much perversion in these places? And let me tell you a little, little personal story about mine. My life, I should say. Um, I had a very hard time overcoming the sin of pornography. I was addicted to pornography for a long, long time, mostly as a lost man, but also after I got saved. I'd get clean from it and stuff. I wouldn't be looking at it, and I'd fall into it again. You know why? 
I didn't really ever put the thing together before in my mind. And I was thinking about this the other day. And I thought, you know, that's interesting, the timing of it. When I got free from pornography, when I got the victory over it, it was after I left the church buildings. And I, you know, I went back to it a little bit there when we moved to uh, Eldred, PA, but I wasn't messing with it then. But the times I was struggling with it, it was because I was still in those Babel buildings. Hmm. Do you reckon that there's a spirit that's attached to those buildings? The pervert palaces? How about uh, Jack and David Hiles and Jack Skep? Jerk Hiles is a uh, son-in-law. How about them? Jack Hiles having the young girls singing songs to him and stuff like this and, and singing songs about his bicep, biceps and his you know, hair and all this other stuff. And he goes and he has secret little meetings with the girls and he has them come in and he hugs them and holds them and stuff like this. Young teenage girls. All the while while fornicating with his deacon's wife, Jenny Nishik. That's Jack Hiles. His son David going and fornicating with multiple members of his church building. And then he gets it so bad they ship him to another church building. Don't expose him. Don't fire him because that would make the body of Christ look bad. Send him someplace else and he does it again. And one of the, the one of the ways he got caught was he guy was taking videos and pictures of himself fornicating with church women. And they found some of the deacons found it in the dumpster of the church building that he was pastoring. Last I heard, I guess he's not in ministry or anything anymore, but you know. And then Jack Schapp, what's he do? Fornicates with a 17 year old. Why? Why? Because they're in pervert buildings. That's why. Another uh, brother and his wife wrote me the one time, told me about how that there was a Baptist church, I believe it was, that they were going to. And they found out that the pastor and his wife were having three-way orgies with other men. Men in the community. And they objected to it, this brother and his wife, they objected to this wicked you know, hireling doing this with his wife and with other men. And they objected to it, and the people were like, oh, but brother so-and-so is such a great man and everything. You see? You see, when you have these pervert buildings, you love the fellowship. Oh, I just love this, the little social thing of everybody getting together as a little social club. And they're basically covert Masonic lodges. We'll be bringing more out on that in the future. Uh, compare the two. They're Masonic lodges. A lot of them were built by Masons. <laughs> you know? Look at the history of, of church buildings. They're built by Masons. Members of the Masonic Lodge. I don't mean just a stone mason, a concrete worker. I'm talking Masonic Lodges. That's what those things are. It's social, community, get-together type of stuff. That's what they are. That's why the people are so dead set on protecting their little church building. Uh, I could show this thing. I'm probably going to save this for another study, This the other thing about the... the uh, you know, church buildings being Masonic lodges, covert Masonic lodges. But there was a video somebody sent me about um, uh, over in Germany. They actually had like this massive, like big cathedral thing. And all these high level Masons came there in their Masonic get up, their regalia there. They came and they're, they're dressed up with their little aprons on and all the other stuff. And by the way, that whole thing is just, it's based on sex perversion. That's their... The, the Masonic apron, when you see it, they have that little white apron on down there, the lambskin. It's the veil between the profane world and their holiest of holies. What's it covering? Well, look at the top of a church building, the steeple there, and you'll get the idea. Okay? And I could keep telling story after story after story after story. But uh, why bother? <laughs> a lot of these people, if you're not convinced by now that church buildings are wrong... Uh, I'm not going to get through your thick skull. Um, I'm going to tell you there's something here real quickly. Um, Acts chapter 5, we're not going to read these verses, but you can read verses 1 down through 10 with the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And judgment was brought very quickly on that group. And they didn't worry about, well, this might look at, make us look bad and stuff like this. I mean, we have two church members here and uh, Ananias and Sapphira and God drops them both dead. Well, that's going to make us look bad in the community. That's going to make us have a bad reputation. They didn't worry about it. Look at verse 11. 
And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Yeah. You know, wouldn't it be nice if the lost world respected Christians because we were different than the lost world? I mean, the lost world has holy temples, don't they? Isn't it a different thing for a Christian to come out and say, actually, I'm in church right now. Say that to a lost person and watch their reaction. You're different. If you worship at home and you say, I worship the Lord at home. In fact, I worship the Lord every day. I don't have some special little day that I dress up and go and do my little thing and whatever else and the rest of the week I live like the devil. Uh-uh. I worship the Lord all the time. I'm different than that lost world out there. I'm not like the Roman Catholics that have a little church building that they go to where they can do their little penance and their little sacraments and whatever else and they come away and then they can do whatever they want and then just confess it to the priest, you know, slip a little bit of money into the uh, box there, the offering box, you know, and I've... Uh, I'll be absolved of my sins. Might have to do a little bit of penance or something if I'm really bad. Uh huh. Yeah. We need to get away from these church buildings. I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm going to give you a prophecy of the future. Uh, the Lord's been revealing this to me more and more, and that is, I believe that the devil is going to bring down the remaining King James only uh, Baptist Bible Baptist type buildings, church buildings. I believe they're going to come down. I believe that there already are. Uh, this brother that I was asked help for and things that, you know, his pastor, uh, this Baptist pastor, wasn't his pastor really, but this Baptist pastor, David St. John, uh, molested his eight-year-old daughters, two little twin girls, uh, eight-year-olds. Um, that's just the beginning. Uh, it's go it's going to come out more and more and more. And if the body of Christ, if, if Bible-believing Christians don't distance themselves from it and say, I'm not part of that. If we don't do that and say, that church building stuff, I'm not part of that. That stuff is wicked. It's pagan. It's of the devil. If you don't do that, you're going to be you're going to go down with a ship. And it's a ship that has no basis in Scripture, too, by the way. Nowhere in Scripture are you told to build a building and call it a church and invite the saved and the lost to it. It's not in there. And it's not in there for a reason. Don't tell me, well, you're arguing from silence. No, I'm arguing with what the Bible teaches and with what I can see plainly with my eyes. All right? They're all over the place. All these Babel buildings, they all have problems. Every single one of them. They all have perversion problems. And that spirit of perversion is growing. It's getting stronger and stronger and stronger right now. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you're tied to one of those things, you're going down. You are going to go down with that satanic building that you are tied to. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you are unrepentant and if you are just like, well, I don't care what you say, you're not saved. I don't believe for one second that you're saved. How can you be saved and go to a building and say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a, I, I'm a, I believe the Bible in all matters of faith and practice. You're lying. Would the Holy Spirit inspire you to say a thing like that? I am a Bible believer in all matters of faith and practice. You don't practice what the book teaches. Brethren, we need to separate ourselves. That's the whole point. You know what the word church means? Let's get a little bit, you know, Greeky here, okay? Church means ecclesia. That's the word. Ecclesia is translated as church in your King James Bible. Ecclesia, another way of saying it is a called out assembly. We're supposed to be different. We are supposed to be different. Do you understand that? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't get away from those buildings, I don't believe you're saved. The time has come when we need to leave these things. We need to be different. You know, one of the reasons I go after Steven Anderson so much, people, you know, what do you waste so much time on him? Is because I want the lost world to see I'm different. I'm not part of that group. Oh, but he uses a King James Bible. You use a King James Bible. Yeah, but he doesn't follow the teachings of this book. And he'll change it when he has to, to line up with his satanic doctrines. I'm not like him. I don't say that all sodomites should just be killed and I make inflammatory statements about the president and whatever else. I don't do that. I believe sodomites can get saved if they repent, if they turn from their sins. See, Andersnake doesn't say that. 
He'll tell you on one hand, it's just belief. Belief is what saves you. And I say, okay, can a sodomite get saved? No. Why? Well, they're in sin. What? But there are sodomites that believe. <laughs> See? No, they have to turn from their sin. That's what salvation is all about. Repentance. All right? But I want to make it plain to the lost world out there. I'm going to speak against the church buildings. I'm going to speak against the Baptists. Anybody that holds on to these stinking buildings and the traditions of men that appear nowhere in Scripture, I'm going to speak against them and I'm going to say, I'm not part of that. Because the persecution is going to come down on them, and rightfully so. Hey, I hope that they persecute David St. John that, that raped the brother's two little twin daughters. I hope they persecute him. I, I'd, I'd like to see the guy put to death for that. To be very honest with you, I think a child molester should be put to death. I think that it's something that they should say that's punishable by death. I really do. Will that happen? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. You know, the brother made the point that he said, you know, eventually it'll be like a hero or something. He'll be like the poster child for the pervert movement or something, you know. But the point is, I want to be different. I want to be separate from that stuff. And I saw just recently, there's another uh, guy in Tennessee or something like this that's raping children there. Another Baptist, another King James only Baptist. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you're a saved man, because I know that there's still some left. If you're a saved man and you're in one of these church buildings and you're pastoring that church building, you're going to go down. I'm going to tell you that. I love you enough to tell you the truth. It's hard truth. I know it's hard for you to accept, but you're going down. That ship that you're on is sinking and you need to get out of that thing. You need to abandon ship quickly and do things the scriptural way, the way it was done in the New Testament. Because right now you're living a lie. And you say, well, brother, I'm going to fight against perversion. I don't have a problem with perversion. Okay, but somebody else will in your little organization there. Somebody else is going to go down and they're going to take you with them. This uh, David St. John guy, the uh, you know uh, lawyers or whoever else, they, the police down there, they confiscated his church building. Just like that. Gone. This work of this council will be of men, it will come to naught. Came to naught. Every church building that's ever been came to naught. Every single one of them. Why? They're of men. They're not of God. So, just want to do a real quick video there. Um, just to warn people. Uh, we need to start to not only say, well, I worship at home, but just simply start saying those church buildings are wicked. We need to distance ourselves from that and say, okay, you know, well, you know that stuff over there, yeah, we're not part of that. Bible-believing Christians are Bible believers in all matters of faith and practice. We practice what this book preaches and what this book teaches. We don't worship in pagan buildings and try to sanctify paganism. We don't do that. We're different. So that's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. Please take my advice. I don't want to see people that are in these Bible buildings. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you're just hateful, you're this, you're that. Man... You need to get straight with God on this. Because if you don't, you're going to see it coming down.